Welcome to Faith in Recovery with Anthony Ankampura. Welcome to Banyan's Faith in Recovery radio show. I'm your host, Anthony Ankampura. The Faith in Recovery radio show focuses on advice and insight for those in addiction and families suffering with mental health issues, powerful personal testimonies, and we have guests who are experts in their field. We definitely have one today, that's for sure. I'm also the director and chaplain at Banyan Treatment Center's Faith in Recovery Treatment Center. And uh, the Faith in Recovery program is a faith-based drug and alcohol treatment center. It's non-denominational. The program is designed to allow clients to establish or restore their faith while addressing their addiction. If you or someone you know is in need of substance treatment, contact us at 888-270-5712, 888-270-5712. Want to get right to it? We have an incredible guest on today. We're so blessed to have him. Uh, one of the top psychiatric people in the country, if not the world, I, I would say. Uh, just an incredible mind and, and has tremendous insight. Dr. Keith Ablo is a forensic psychiatrist, author, and television personality. He is also a contributor on the topic of psychiatry for the Fox News Channel, The Blaze. He, he was uh, the host and executive producer of his own national daily talk show, The Dr. Keith Ablo Show. He has written columns for publications including the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA News and World Report, USA Today, Newsweek, the Boston Globe, and foxnews.com, many others as well. He has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, wow, uh, the Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS Early Show, Larry King Live, the Dr. Oz Show, Fox and Friends, he has written 15 books, some published by the American Psychiatric Association. He is a graduate of Brown University, received a Bachelor's of Science in Neurosciences. He received his Doctor of Medicine from John Hopkins Medical School and has completed his psychiatry residence at the Tufts New England Medical Center. Boy, that, and that's just the abbreviated version of his bio. I could have been going on here for the whole show. Uh, I think the only thing he wasn't involved in was the moon landing, man. It's just unbelievable, some of this stuff. And uh, that's not to say you're, you're uh, of that age, uh, doctor. Uh, so I want to welcome now. I want to welcome. I, I sound old. I, I feel old now, Anthony, after listening to that. It, it's, uh, all, but... it's all your credentials. It's unbelievable. But uh, I just wasn't sleeping a lot. <laughs> very, very impressive. I want, I want uh, to introduce him right now to the Faith and Recovery radio show, Dr. Keith Abla. Welcome to the show, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure, Anthony. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Such, it's such a really, it really is a blessing to have you. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of these, some of these mass shootings that are happening out there. It seems like what happens is they happen, and then you know, the you know may, maybe uh, distributors and out there uh, news news channels they end up covering it for a couple weeks and. It, you know, you'll have like CNN saturating the news coverage with, you know, everybody crying and the license, you know, blaring, sirens blaring, those types of things. And then it kind of dies down and you don't hear about it for a while. I mean, if we go back to Columbine, Columbine High School, 1999, we lost 13, 13 people there, right? And then, and we're about four and a half months from Parkland, the Parkland shootings, which was another horrendous situation. And uh, we lost 17 there, and we're coming up on six years from the Sandy Hook massacre, which was uh, in 2012, 27 killed there. So, and, and, and many of these, there's been many other ones too, but those I just wanted to mention. But uh, many of these, um, there, there have been people involved with that had mental health issues or disorders or mental illness. So the question is, um, you probably get this all the time, uh, Dr. Uh, Keith, so I want to ask you, are people with mental illness more violent than others? Well, I don't think uh, that if you looked at 
the wide swath of people, we're talking millions, millions and millions of people who suffer with depression, with anxiety disorders, with bipolar disorder, with any number of conditions. It's a, it's a tiny minority of those people who hurt anybody, right? These are people who are suffering, who need help. And by and large, if you said, well, what's the percentage chance one of those people is going to shoot up a school? You'd say, well, it's negligible. It's infinitesimal. However, the converse isn't true. If you look at the people who are doing the shootings and you say, no, 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 let's start with that tiny group. How many of them are mentally ill? I'd say, oh, well, of those folks, it's an incredible percentage. It's most, if not all, are suffering with one or more psychiatric illnesses. And so it, it dis dispirits me when people, for political reasons, say that this, is, that this is an issue about guns, for instance. Sure. When these folks, we already know from other terrible losses of life, where people have lost their lives when somebody plows a van into a crowd, or where explosives, as in the Boston Marathon, are used crockpots right, filled with, with metal objects, um, or where somebody uses a knife to kill several people. We know that it's not the guns. The common denominator here is, yes, people are slipping through the cracks. That tiny percentage of folks who are mentally ill, who are violently mentally ill, are slipping through the cracks because our mental health care system is inadequate. The safety net is frayed beyond recognition. And third-party insurers don't want to do anything about that because they're entirely focused on profit, and we're letting them do it. Right. Absolutely. I, I think we had a guest on a couple weeks ago, DJ Jaffe. He's the executive uh, director of mentalillnesspolicy.org, and he broke it down really well, but he was talking about basically 18% annually somebody will have a diagnosable mental health disorder and then he and then and then seven percent would be severely I, not seven four percent would be severely mentally ill and he was talking about a subset of the four percent so if somebody's severely mentally ill with somebody some of the things that you mentioned earlier and then it's a subset of that and it's really the ones that go untreated that seem to be become more violent i don't know if that's if that's what you uh if you agree with that that makes great sense to me and uh, when you look at the psychiatric histories in terms of the kinds of treatment that have been offered to these people, you know, the hair curls at the back of your neck because I know the system. I know how uh, unfortunate it is that people go to ERs and they don't get the help they need, right? So they go to ERs, they say, you know, I'm thinking, God forbid, of hurting myself or someone else. What do they hear? Well, is there, can you contract for safety? Are you, are you able to say you won't do it? Mm -hmm. Wait a sec, what happened to the fact that they just came in and said that they're thinking of doing it? Exactly. That question from the clinician is designed to show them the exit door because somehow third-party insurers have been able to telegraph and almost implant into the thinking processes of clinicians, well, we really need to do the bidding of these insurers because we're going to get heck. If we call and we try to get somebody admitted, it's the third degree from these reviewers. Right. So it's better if we can divert them. Well, exactly. Unless they shoot somebody. Exactly. You're almost forced to commit a violent act to, to get any help, it seems like, and, and to get more uh -huh. attention. You know, it, it never made any sense to me if basically you're going off of what the person that's dealing with the, the mental illness is telling you, for one, and then you're kind of steering them for what you just said, like with insurance or, you know, they just don't want to deal with it or whatever the case may be, you're steering them to go out the door rather than admit, you know? And I think that's where a big problem happens and there's there's definitely area for opportunity there because, you know, it, like you said, if someone says, well, I, I just was going to kill myself, but right now I don't have a plan. Okay, you're all set. See you later. You know, how yeah. does that make any sense? I, it doesn't to me. I don't well, know. It, it makes no sense. And, and, of course, you know, sometimes in my office somebody will say, I've got these thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, you know, can you promise me 
percent, you would never, absolutely never act on them. And if somebody balks and seems reticent to say, I would never, ever, there's no chance, then I send them to the emergency room. I can even send them on a commitment form in the state of Massachusetts. Strangely, of course, when they get there and they realize, oh, wait, now I'm going to have to go upstairs to the psychiatric unit, they may well reverse course. So I get these really nonsensical calls, not infrequently from clinicians saying, well, I know he told you that he was thinking of killing his family, but here in the ER, he's not saying that. So we were thinking we would send him home. Right. Like, well, hold on a second. It's only been 45 minutes. And, you know, down in the ER, he may be thinking, I don't like the food. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really want to go upstairs. It's going to be a pain in the neck, and I'm going to miss work. Uh, the people don't make sense in those situations. And so uh, it also may be an hour or two or three or five hours before they're seen by a clinician. And maybe the drugs that they use, the street drugs, have worn off. But guess what? They're going to use street drugs again yeah. and have those same thoughts. But, again, what's happened is there's been a kind of code that has gone out where those clinicians aren't able to think anymore, unfortunately, what's the right thing to do. They think what's the thing to do that comports with the expectations of the reviewer on the other phone uh, talking to me. Because right. I don't want to get in trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's so many things that figure into this. But, you know, with this latest one, with the Parkland shooting, we saw how many red flags were missed, obviously with the FBI and with uh, Broward Sheriff's Office and all these different over and over and over these things missed. But I, the reality is I would think it's the mental health system that's breaking down for it to even get to the point where the police are involved and they're calling the FBI and stuff like that. So why do you think there are so many red flags that, that went up with uh, this kid you know, from Parkland and why were they missed and what could we do to to change that process well man they're missed partly because there are a number of elements to this bad calculus one is psychiatrists who are the most well trained you can you know they're very good nurses they're very good social workers they're very good psychologists absolutely but psychiatrists really are uh, very well trained to think about things in terms of etiology uh, in terms of causation and in terms of prognosis. And psychiatrists have been sidelined, okay, because uh, the last thing that these insurance companies want to do is pay for better trained people to be doing the work. So what you get is you get social workers, line clinicians who are overwhelmed uh, and who aren't the best trained possible people. They're, they're good people and they're, they, they do what they do very well. But the, the best clinicians have been sidelined because the insurers don't want to pay for their time. So number one, you're unlikely to interact with a psychiatrist directly when you're being evaluated. Right. Psychiatrists have been relegated to medication prescribers. I don't just prescribe medicine. I provide psychotherapy and medicine. I'm thinking about the whole person. I'm able to elicit thoughts and feelings from patients. And I'm not shy about protecting the patient too. So, you know, you get folks who feel like, well, you know, boy, this would be a terrible chapter in this person's history having to go to the psychiatric hospital. Not really. Not when you think that the other option is imprisonment for decades, if God forbid things go bad. Sure. So I think those are all elements. And then there's, it's more than just the mental health care system. It's our politically correct mm. culture. Yeah. Because if you look at these shooters, I wrote an article, a blog for foxnews.com. I said, if you look at a lot of them, they seem to have Asperger's yeah. disorder or syndrome. Mm -hmm. They're on the autism spectrum. A lot of them are socially isolated. They're fascinated by computer games. Uh, they uh, may um, be tremendously interested in things that are mechanical, like guns, uh, or any other number of things, like explosives. And they may be nursing terrible feelings of being isolated because they can't connect socially. Well, it was as though I had said something awful to suggest that there might be a common thread called Asperger's amongst so many of these killers it was as though I was accusing everyone with anything on the autism spectrum of being a killer. No, 
I'm simply trying right. to unravel the mystery of what's happening. But our culture is so ready to criticize the truth now. Anything that hurts somebody's feelings potentially, even if it's the truth, people want you to shut up. Exactly. That's a problem, too. Well said. Very, very well said. We're going to need to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in 30 seconds. Fanny's Faith and Recovery Radio Show. We're here with Dr. Keith Abla. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Are you struggling with addiction or mental health disorders? Banyan Treatment Center's Faith and Recovery Program helps people at the depths of their despair, spreading the word that recovery is possible through the power of Christ. Cry out to him. Where are you, God? Where are you? I don't feel you. Where's your presence? Why are you allowing this to happen? He already knows our thoughts anyway. We might as well just put it out there. Program Director Anthony Ancapura will help you discover how God can turn your mess into your message. Call Banyan Treatment Center for help now. 888-230-3122. Again, that's 888-230-3122. Welcome back to Bandit's Faith and Recovery Radio Show. I'm your host, Anthony Akinpora. What an amazing guest that we have on today, Dr. Keith Abla. Blessed to have him here. We're talking about mental illness and the, and the mental health system and, and things of that nature. And I just want to pick up from where, kind of where we left off, Dr. Abloh. There's a study by the uh, Arizona, uh, Arizona State University and Northeastern Illinois University. It says this. It says, mass shootings and school attacks do inspire copycats. As many as 20 to 30 percent of the attacks are set off by other attacks, right? So it says the effect lasts about 13 days. Uh, they write this report published in the uh, Public Library of Science Journal. So basically what they're saying and what a lot of people have been saying with this situation. I know I, I did work with uh, Dr. Park Dietz with his uh, threat assessment group when I worked in Manhattan in the security as a security director. And, and I, sure. I tell you, that was a big, he was a huge uh, advocate of that. He was talking about that 15, 20 years ago about the media has to stop saturating the coverage for weeks and showing the, showing the killer and putting his name out there and showing his life history and when he was a little kid up to, up to the time that he made the, made the shooting happen. And so th I think this is partly to do with this. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Uh, Keith? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, we live in a culture uh, where we're all copying. Uh, so many of us are copying all the time because what used to be more out of one's core, right, one's own thoughts, one's own feelings, one, one's own connection to God has been eroded by the intrusion of things like Facebook where you're told to tell your story according to a template and where you aren't going to say the things that are truly bothering you, you're going to attempt to fabricate portions of your existence. And we, we don't think about that. We don't think about the fact that so many uh, computer games or video games and so many sites like secondlife.com, they encourage you to say, well, don't stay rooted in yourself yourself being a gift from the Almighty. Instead, it's fine to leave the bindings of your life story. Leave them behind. Invent an avatar for yourself. Be anything. Now, when you start to do that, you leave people vulnerable to being commandeered by what they find to be exciting dramas. Well, uh, if you're able to confabulate, fib a little bit, uh, use lots of poetic license in saying who you are on Facebook, uh, well, then maybe the idea of emulating someone who has gotten some terrible notoriety, who's infamous, has more pull on you because you're not rooted, right? You're spiritually adrift, and therefore you're recruitable. Why did we have people joining ISIS? Did they, were they zealot? Americans going to join ISIS? No, they were unrooted. They had nothing, no sense of self. Therefore, they were able to be recruited into someone else's powerful drama. Yeah. That's why there are copycats in the world. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They're just the leading edge of copycats. There are tens of millions of copycats in America now who have lost their core. 
That's why they're attracted to daily marijuana. That's why they would rather text than talk. That's why they're on video games four hours a day. Right. We have to reverse that trend. And one of the ways is bring back spirituality because it's tough. It's very tough to commandeer someone who knows that he or she is connected to the infinite irretrievably, irretrievably, irrevocably, and for certain. Wow. Yes, yes, well said, very well said. That's such a great point, the spirituality, the faith Thanks, component. Buddy. That faith component is huge. We see it with our clients. We, we, we have clients that come into our program at the Faith and Recovery Program, and they're completely broken. And they're completely sometimes yep. hopeless, and and they've had a lot of people write them off, including their families. So when when they start hearing things about God is a forgiving God, and He's merciful, and He loves you, and He has a plan for your life, you know they, their eyes light up. You know they have a glimmer of hope because it's like really I thought He was trying to throw me in hell. I thought He was ready to judge me, <laughs> and and they and they like they they can't believe it. They're like I never heard of that. Nobody ever told me. That you know, Jesus hung around with the worst people there was back in, the, in in his time, so it's encouraging to them. And a lot of them really never have never heard it, you know. So it's just it's very very. They, they haven't. Yes, yes. They yeah. haven't. And you know, if you make it mundane, because you know, like you know, you won't speak to everyone when you speak the language of religion because some people just can't hear. But if you even say to people, listen, when you go to a movie, and the main character's in a whole lot of trouble. Things are falling apart all around them. Do you walk out? They'll be like, what? No, of course. So well, why are you walking out on your story? Right. You just told me you were thinking of taking your life. Why do you think that you're not 37 minutes into a film that by an hour and a half has you resurrected? Yes. Okay, word choice intentional, resurrected. <laughs> And they'll step back a little bit. Wait a second. You mean I'm not seeing the whole story? I said, no, no, no. You're not seeing the whole story because you can't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. But there is one. Right. Right. Excellent. Well said. So, so let me just get back to this one point that we we were touching on earlier. And and I'm not talking about like necessarily like yourself and, and private practices. But if you're talking about emergency room psychiatrist and and that whole thing and you know we have the baker act down here in florida and you know they're sent into an emergency room and evaluated within 72 hours and most of the time like we talked about it's like oh yeah i'm fine now i feel better okay go ahead but they're really not right now how, how would someone know and maybe we have to maybe it's a matter of looking at you know changing the you know hipaa laws and things like that but everybody is so nervous and so afraid to ask anything that a lot of times things aren't even asked at all so if we're going off somebody that's psychotic and we're going off of someone that had the police come to their house 42 times and but you know and, and those types of things but we don't know that if you're the psychiatrist and you're the you're the psychiatrist in the emergency room and all basically we're asking them is you know do you feel like harming yourself or someone else and they don't have any of this other information how could they really make a you know logical or an informed decision don't you think there should be like a file or a database or something that that psychiatrist could pull from and say okay yeah you're telling me this but i have all this here and it doesn't add up what do you what do you think about that I think we need a comprehensive um, system, and it wouldn't be very hard, frankly. In other words, if we empowered certain folks, clergy, teachers, nurses, and healthcare personnel, and family members, to, um, uh, to call crisis teams, which they can right now, they're community mental health centers, and they have crisis teams. Uh, if we got the word out, listen, those folks are able to call those crisis teams, and then what the crisis team receives can be communicated either to a judge or to an ER. But you, that if we used our court systems to say, look, if you feel that somebody's at risk for violence, you're able to lobby a crisis team to then um, present the findings to even a judge and say, listen, if a forensic psychiatrist backs us up, this person needs to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. That alone would go a tremendous way toward helping things. We could also get the word out that, listen, um, the courts 
are situated well. I've had a number of people, and you said this, Anthony, you said it's so bad that people say, you know, hopefully he'll be arrested and he'll get some mental health care. Well, I've told some families sometimes, hey, look, instead of always trying to hire the next lawyer and get your son or daughter out of trouble for the infractions that seem to be building towards something terrible, how about if you did press charges for one thing? The person will get it continued without a finding. Not the worst thing. It goes away after a time. Uh, And the judge is then able to say, well, as a condition of your release, you're going to be drug tested randomly. You're going to be uh, taking the medicines as prescribed by a psychiatrist, and you're going to go to rehab. Uh, Are you okay with that? Most people will say, okay, I'll do it. Right? And then at least you have a tether on them. Right now we have no safety net. Right. And also, by the way, as I already alluded to, there ought to be the capacity for designated clinicians in ERs to say, I'm invoking whatever it might be, the TOPS program, I called it, which means that you, Mr. Insurer, cannot refuse admission for this patient uh, unless it's proven in retrospect that I was wrong to admit them. We're going to shift the burden to you And if you want to be in business as an insurer, if we say that we're running this one up the flagpole, Mm -hmm. uh, we're at risk because if you prove we were wrong, we owe you some money. But if we're not wrong, you pay. That's the price of doing business in this state. Absolutely. That would go a long way, too, because then people wouldn't be so scared. Very, very well said. Thank you for that. Uh, We're going to need to end. Uh, Dr. Keith, uh, anything you want to put out there, people could follow you, how they could get a hold of you with your practice? Sure. Put it out there. Yeah, go ahead. Very easy. KeithAblo.com, K-E-I-T-H-A-B-L-O-W.com. So if you go to KeithAblo.com, I see patients. I see them by Skype. I do it by phone. I have people all over the world I work with. And uh, it's a privilege to do it, uh, i got to tell you, because there's a great confluence between spirituality and psychiatry when psychiatry is properly practiced. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, my name is Anthony Akinpora. Join us every Saturday and Sunday at 1.30 on The Word, 94.9 FM and AM 950. Or... Um, Faith Talk Atlanta, 970 a.m. at 930 on Saturdays. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. God bless you. God bless you, Dr. Keith. Thank you, Anthony. God bless you as well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you.